cybersecurity? There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to the show. Today is Monday, November 27th, 2023. Welcome to episode number 502 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier. And over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Peter Lee, Alfredo, Hinoso, Jide E. Senfilis, Medin, Matthew Necci, Josh Mason, formerly of Mason SC, NSA Virus Labs, Toasty. Pops, my man, Marcus Kyler's in here somewhere with the Yeats. <laughs> Matt McDaniel, the Hamburglar. Sharice, folks over on LinkedIn, YouTube. Guys, long timers, first timers. We're all going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So if you're looking to break into the industry, uh, well, first of all, if you're a practitioner, you can use this information as you're well aware to help drive cyber risk reduction for your business stakeholders and stay on top of developing threats. But if you're looking to break into the industry, we got you uh, sorted out because you will be asked in any single job interview, how do you stay current in the industry? And the Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing podcast, in my humble opinion, is a phenomenal answer. And if you yourself have used it, hey, David Monge on your third episode, we'll count that. If you yourself have used it in a job interview, would love to hear about it. Love to hear your experience. Hey, KP, DP, hope you all are well out there. Out there uh, getting up early. Love it, love it, love it. Guys, before we get into the show, before we shred the top cybersecurity news stories, before some of us look like this, right? Before this happens to all of us, let me give a shout out and uh, much love and praise to the stream sponsor start with my good friend Eric Taylor over at Barricade Cyber Solutions. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But guess what, y'all? Guess what? Just like taking that extra, um, extra serving of stuffing on Thursday night, Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to make you smile and mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. Hey, Alan Norris, thanks for the four months of love. Uh, really quickly, uh, squad members, there are two new emotes if you're interested, squad members. We got the so hot right now, and ah, uh, you gotta patch it. Uh, emotes, uh, definitely listening to y'all. Hey, Mr. Green Reads, good to see you. Definitely listen to the community and getting those emotes in there, and don't forget, about the recent edition of Mod Love. Gotta love the mods, uh, always helping out and making the show as great as it can be. Also wanna say from a sponsor perspective, holla to Panopsi Security. Guys, get a partner who understands your cyber program and your business goals. Panopsi can come in and do a quantified risk assessment, really understand what your business is doing from a fractional VCSO perspective, which means they're not trying to take your job, they're not trying to outsource you, they're literally trying to give you, you know that meme where the guy's going for the balloon and then there's like a bigger guy holding that guy with the balloon? Panop I might even make this meme. Panopsi is the bigger guy, you're the smaller guy, and the balloon is your information security program driving cyber risk reduction for your stakeholders. Get it? Panopsi.com. If you need a, a helping hand, if you need a lend, that's what's up. Panopsi.com, links in the description below. Also, anti-siphon training, but more about them at the mid-roll. 
Guys, I want to say thank you so much for being supportive squad members and just regular uh, Simply Cyber YouTube members, all those over on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for all the support you do um, and enabling me to deliver this podcast to you every single morning. Uh, I just take a moment to ex extend my sincere appreciation uh, for each of you. Now, in true reciprocating fashion, did you know each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE? William Kubix with the first live show. Welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. Listen, if you um, need continuing professional education credits or continuing education units, you know if you do. Hey, Omatola, good to see you. Wow. Listen. If you need CPEs, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE, one half, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it stacks half CPE today, half tomorrow, half Wednesday, half Thursday, half Friday. Wait a minute. Did this just stack two and a half a week, 10 a month? Yes, it did. So say what's up in chat, grab a screen cap, file it away and get those CPEs. Don't make CPEs a sucky experience. Just pick them up as you go through the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. The networking, look over here. Jesus Banda, Divine Dream Divine, Johnny Five, Will Reed, TJ Zimmer. What's up, Will Reed? Smash that like button. Chris Young, Bjorn. Bjorn, who's always helping me with web app attacks. Guys, the networking's phenomenal. The news is great. You are all amazing. Let's get those CPEs. Now, if you're live, hashtag team live in chat, like Alicia, Jerry, and Peter Lee. But if you are on replay, hashtag team replay, do enjoy it, Team Replay people. I uh, love the comments you drop in chat. Uh, also remember that on um, this uh, December 13th, I'm doing an all hands where I'm going to be revealing some big stuff, things that would impact uh, kind of the Team Live, Team Replay thing. Uh, um, going to be changing things up just a little bit, nothing dramatic or catastrophic, but just something to um, keep in the back of your mind. All right, guys, I am super, super excited for today's stream. Obviously, I haven't seen what's up. It is Monday, so I got a huge coffee cup. Let me uh, fix my floor mat here. All right, hopefully everyone's good. Hey, Laura Flores, good to see you, JD. Good to see you, LG. Hey, Chris Young, as usual. Kimberly can fix it. Wow. Guys, oh, by the way, uh, we've got our, um, we've got, it's Monday, which means we have a special segment. Uh, where it used to be uh, Callan's Art of the Week. We have uh, flipped the script on that, and now we are doing um, uh, Simply Cyber Community Member of the Week. So, or not Community Member of the Week, but you know what I mean. Featured Community Member. I, I forgot to get the artwork for that, so I'm working on that right now. <laughs> All right. All right, guys, so do me a favor, sit back, relax, and let's let the cool sounds of the hot news Percy! wash over all of us in an awesome wave. I will catch you all at the mid-roll. Let's get into it. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Monday, November 27th, 2023. I'm Steve Prentice. It was a busy week last week in spite of and because of the U.S. Thanksgiving holidays, so a number of stories collected together under sectors. In the financial sector, London and Zurich and Fidelity National Financial suffer attacks. A ransomware attack at the direct debit collection company London and Zurich began on November 10th, leaving customers in the dark as to whether collections can be made. The firm's own system status portals show progress being made as of this recording, but the outage affected a number of large organizations that use the firm for payment collection. Meanwhile, Fidelity National Financial, which provides title insurance and settlement services for the mortgage and real estate industries, shut down some of its services due to a breach which affected real estate agents and home buyers. In the healthcare sector, the Royal Families Hospital and Vanderbilt University. All right, hold on one second. So, uh, you know, I don't prepare, or, <laughs> excuse me, I don't prepare or research any of these stories in advance. So uh, I'm, you're getting my raw take. But at the same time, the podcast, because they were off Wednesday, thir or Thursday, Friday, um, they've stacked stories together. So it's it, just give me a moment because it's kind of hard to tell when they're switching into the next story. All right, so... 
this story affects more UK and uh, European based people. But here is here is the TLDR. This is a ransomware attack. OK, by the way, cyber sec, which 20 years in the field and finding value in the podcast. Uh, thank you, cyber sec, which uh, very, very uh, happy to hear that. Thank you very much. Um, listen, here's the deal. Ransomware, they don't care whether it is. Ransomware doesn't care if it's a manufacturing company, a bank, small business, Fortune 50 company. They just want to cash, homie. They just want to get paid. You know what I'm saying? So here is the interesting thing. Um, this attack started November 10th. That was two weeks ago. <laughs> so definitely serious. Um, it's an interesting um, victim to attack because they're attacking people that would ultimately be involved in uh, generating payroll for businesses. Uh, which obviously, if you guys don't know, uh, I mean, <laughs> of course you all know, here's the deal. Like if a company can't pay payroll, it's devastating. You want to talk about catastrophic impact? Like I get that you could be like, oh, we're all a family here. And like, I love the mission and all that. But guess what? Like being real, real, we all go to work to make money, right? Like unless you're financially independent and you're doing philanthropy at the end of the day, if your business, and I've, I've experienced this firsthand, okay? Like some of you know that story. I've experienced this firsthand. If the business tells you you're not getting your paycheck tomorrow when you expect to get your paycheck, you're immediately looking for a new job. Uh, like immediately, because what are you doing? You're wasting your time. You're like, you know what I mean? And like, they'll still owe you. <clears throat> they'll still owe you for the work that you performed, but who knows when you're going to get that. And guess what? We've all got bills to pay. We all have mouths to feed. We all have backs that need clothing. So yeah, you can go a few days, but in the re reality, dude, um, you're not going a long period of time. So to me, the ransomware attack here is interesting because typically ransomware threat actors uh, are trying to leverage the, the victim organization to pay the ransom. And they're usually doing it through like embarrassing the organization, uh, revealing competitive um, information, like intellectual property, um, internal emails, forecasting that stuff, right? And that type of, those two things are common leverage techniques, right? Uh, but this one, if you can somehow disable a company from paying payroll, I'm telling you guys, that is a really catastrophic impact and one that, um, frankly, uh, is a compelling leverage for a business to be like, no mas, make, pay the ransomware, let, let it, let's let it go. Um, now, I also want to point out, so here's the TLDR. If you're working in a business, when you're doing business impact analysis, I know, he, okay, so here's the real deal, okay? Like, I always like to try to give information to um, practitioners so they can you know, use it to drive cyber risk reduction. Two things going on here, two things. One, when you are doing business impact analysis, which is a GRC function and one that you should be doing, you're supposed to be talking to the business. Yes, I get it. Like, oh, like this widget manufacturing thing, it, you know, we needed to make money or like this is our ERP solution. We needed to like pay, pay like not payroll, but finance, account payable, account receivable, all, you know, HR, all this crap, right? Yes, I get it. Those are important. But when you're looking at business impact, don't just look at the processes that are generating business, that are generating revenue for the business. You need to look at internal processes, starting, frankly, with payroll. And if you outsource your payroll to ADP, which is a common practice, especially with smaller businesses, that's fine. Or if you outsource it at all, that's fine. The question is, what happens if that business gets ransomware? You should work through that scenario with your businesses if you have the time, okay? It's a real question. And oh, by the way, you want to talk about getting some um, some integration and some some like, head, you know, you want to see a, um, a CEO pop their head up from their iPhone while you're doing a tabletop exercise? Say, hey, here's the scenario. Payroll company has been ransomware. Payroll will not be coming until further notice. Go. That's that's a that's a reality that you can't dance away from. You can't be like, ah, oh, the workforce will be fine. Oh, we're all a family. Bullshit. Sorry, Kennedy. You've got a week, maybe two, before your top talent is going to leave because they can just get a job instantly. 
your mid talent is sniffing around and your talent that's going to have a difficult jo- time finding a new job, they're going to not be sniffing around. But obviously, if you play it forward, um, your underperformers are the ones who are going to continue to be there. So I'm not saying anyone here is an underperformer. What I am saying is you need to give this scenario credence when you're doing tabletop exercises. I know it's fun to just do ransomware for your business, but you need to think of third-party risk management. Call Neil Bridges, let him know third-party risk management is back on the docket and work through it because this right here can be devastating to a business. University Med Center suffer cybersecurity incidents. The UK government's communications headquarters known as GCHQ is investigating a cyber attack on the King Edward VIII Hospital, a private hospital used by members of the UK. Yeah, really quickly, I see Professor Black Ops in chat talking about a BIA in Discord. I'm not sure where that link is, but he's 100% right. A couple years ago, like it might even have been more than two years ago, honestly, Professor Black Ops. I feel like it was uh, ooh, like just like early 2020, like like pandemic was like a thing, but not really yet. I feel like that's when Kronos got hit and um, maybe 2019. But Kronos is a major player in the uh, you know outsourced payroll space and they got hit with ransomware. So definitely a good point. Okay, royal family amongst others. The incident is being blamed on a third party with, quote, a small amount of data, end quote, including confidential medical information stolen. Just 1% of patients were affected by the breach, and none of which include the royals, whose data is stored on a separate system from the one that was hacked. Meanwhile, in Nashville, Tennessee, the Vanderbilt <coughs> University Medical Center said it is, quote, investigating a cybersecurity incident that led to the compromise of a database, end quote. According to the record, on Thanksgiving, the hospital system was added to the leak site of the Meow ransomware gang. That's M-E-O-W, the traditional spelling, Uh a relatively new operation that researchers are still examining. All right. So first of all, CatGPT must be in his glory right now. Shall we play a game? CatGPT talking about the Meow ransomware threat actor group. I'm, I'm just saying, oh, thanks NSA Virus Lab for confirming late 2019. Nailed it. I, I love I love it when I can pull a, um, an accurate fact out. Um, so the Meow ransomware, I guess they're taking on Flaming Donkey, whatever. Um, two things. One, they're, again, they're mixing stories here because of the couple days off. Vanderbilt Medical Center had a uh, database accessed. <clears throat> two things going on here. One, this isn't a ransomware incident. Two, it is medical information, which means they're going to have to show up on the HIPAA OCR, Office of Civil Rights, uh, or Health and Human Services, Office of Civil Rights, Wall of Shame. Uh, This is a academic medical center. I did work in one of those for several years, so I understand the challenges that go on there. Here's what happened. This was a misconfigured database all day, every day. That's all it is. Misconfigured database, nothing nefarious. Um... The hackers probably didn't have to hack anything. They probably just accessed. I don't know why I put quotes around access. They probably just accessed the database, dumped it, and then called it a day. Um, so poor <laughs> poor uh, practices on Vanderbilt's side. I'm sure someone's going to get their um, wrist slapped on this one. Guys, I worked in Academic Medical Center for a while. Here's the deal. They were probably like... Um, they were probably like riding low on the hip on a train bound for glory. They're just shooting from the hip. Ooh, we're into R&D. Ooh, let's do gen pop stuff. Ooh, give me that data set. Let's do all sorts of collaborations, integrations. Let's run it through an LLM. Woo! Woo! And, And here's the deal. Nobody told those people, those researchers, that you need to configure um, by, you know, security is not enabled by default. You have to configure the databases. You have to change crappy passwords. You have to not make it publicly facing. You have to make sure it doesn't have a public IP address unless it's supposed to. You have to make sure it's behind a firewall. You need to make sure it's patched. You need to make sure that only the right people have access to it. A million things, Vanderbilt. So again, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus, but I'm sure if I had to guess, this issue falls squarely on the shoulders of like one or two people and unfortunately, the whole organization gets hosed on it. Um, fun fact: I don't know if we have a um, uh, a hype uh, a a, 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 um, a bot command for this, but I literally just released a free 
course on cybersecurity threat exposure or excuse me, continuous threat exposure management, um, which, uh, hold on one second. Can I, I'm just going to do this. Continuous threat exposure management. Oh my God, get out of here. So um, why would you want to take this? Because I, I literally go into how misconfigured cloud assets, specifically databases, but not exclusively databases, are a major problem. And if you've taken my course, this one right here, which is free and open to everyone, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm just saying this, again, this costs zero dollars. So I'm not plugging it as like a Black Friday special. I'm just telling you this particular problem right here, I literally cover exhaustively in this course on why you need to be mindful of it and how to handle it. All right. Oh, thanks, James McQuig. And I love the shirt too. Um, so anyways, giddy up on that. Uh, the final thing I'll say just to kind of throw shade here, <laughs> throw in shade. Um, a hospital in the UK that is favored by the royal family. Guess what? No one cares about you, royal family. I hate to I hate to be this person, okay? But the royal family is off-brand Kardashians. I don't care. I don't think many people do care. I, I get that Kim Kardashian has 235 million Instagram followers or whatever it is. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Who cares? The royal family is an antiquated concept. I don't like, ugh, like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. The aviation sector Gulf Air was exposed to a data breach. Gulf Air, the state owned airline of Bahrain, has stated it suffered a data breach on Friday, which they said meant, quote, some information from the company's email system and customers' database could be compromised, end quote. Emergency plans were deployed to contain the breach, and the airline says, quote, operations and vital systems were not affected, end quote. Yeah, James McQuiggan, I get you were born in the UK. Like, tell me King Charles' middle name. Tell me who's third in line of, for the crown or whatever it is. Tell me where the crown jewel, like, it's ridiculous. It's a, it's a throwback to monarchy and colonialism, and it just... What are we doing here? Oh, all right. All right, James McQuiggan. We can talk. We can. All right. So Alex, Alex is saying, okay, so people care. People care about the, the Royals. All right. I stand. Listen, here's the deal. We are all open to our own opinions. I am, I am definitely inclusive and supportive and will respect other people's opinions. I personally don't get it. I don't get the Royals. I don't, I don't get it. Okay. So maybe someone can explain to me, but Alex, James McQuiggan, I know I have a platform up here, so I'm not going to uh, crush and say it's wrong. Thank you, James McQuiggan. Did you Google that? All right. All right. So I, st I listen, I'm going to, I'm going to put the Royals down and I'm going to slowly back away. Okay. And I'm backing away. Okay. So that take age like old milk. All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll play this for me. You are so dumb. <clears throat> you are really dumb. For real. Okay. That was directed at me. Apparently the Royals are a thing. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. So Gulf Air exposed to data breach. Vital ops not affected. Uh, I don't know what Gulf Air is. Apparently it's a... Um, I mean, obviously it's an airline, airline, but I'm not sure if it's like a private airline or if it's a massive, you know, commercial airline like Delta and American, just somewhere else <clears throat> in the world. This story doesn't really have any um, meat to it. Um, looks like it's a company, a company that flies around for Bahrain. Um, company's email, customer database could have been compromised. Um, okay, so Gulf Air airline company hit. They are involved in, they do fly to Israel and Tel Aviv. So perhaps there's something, excuse me, Israeli and Hamas related and they got hit. It doesn't seem that way. I mean, threat actors got into their email, probably, honestly, probably popped some type of um, 
you know, somebody's creds and got into their email and then they were able to discover it through uh, logs and stuff like that. So, you know, there we go. It, not really, again, for, for having like several days off, this story is pretty thin, okay? <laughs> In the national security sector, a U.S. nuclear lab and Canadian military and RCMP were affected by a breach. All right, hold on. Super chat coming in. Did we just become best friends? Yep. James and you're still my brother from another mother. No hard feelings. At least you didn't call out Doctor Who. Those would be fighting words. Happy Monday, Team Live. Coffee cup cheers. Yeah, absolutely, James. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying anyone that's like into the royals are like, you know, subhuman or something like that it's just i don't get it i to me it's the same the same thing with the kardashians i don't get the kardashians i don't understand the 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 grip you know what i mean but it is what it is okay so detailed data on employees of u.s national security lab leak online this must be a follow-up from the idaho national labs the other day um okay all right um Okay, here we go. So Idaho National Labs. Here we go. This is an aerial view. This is definitely Idaho for sure. Remember they got hacked last week. We talked to some people uh, in chat about, um, you know, like I said personally, like this is kind of crazy. I definitely wouldn't want to touch Idaho National's labs. They're doing nuclear stuff there. They're doing high-end tech research there. Um, it looks like it's mostly not you know, security related or nuclear related or energy related research. It's mostly um, individual information, but obviously the FBI got involved. When you're messing with the Department of Energy, you definitely don't want to screw around with that. Um, some information that was leaked and provided is socials. Oh my God. Social, socials, healthcare, bank account, routing numbers. So to me, this is all HR information. They got into HR, right? HR is definitely different than like how much uranium you're storing or what kind of like nuclear enrichment program you're running. However, and by the way, I would almost I would almost venture a guess that Idaho National Labs and the other 17 nuclear related energy labs in the United States are definitely implementing better cybersecurity practices than other federal IT agencies, if I had to guess, uh, to the point of almost segmentation of the nuclear research type stuff versus IT operations and business operations like HR and payroll, right? Like bank accounts, routing numbers, types of accounts. To me, this is for payroll and accounts payable, marital status, again, HR related, healthcare, socials, HR related. It does seem like a... Um, um, a contained breach, right? So the impact was a little bit lower, but I still wouldn't screw around with Idaho National Labs. From a national security perspective, we look like we're okay, but I wouldn't be surprised. I, I, okay, so here's a little bit of a hot take. A little bit of a hot take on, um, let me get my tinfoil hat out. Doink, 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 doink. A little bit of a hot take if I had to guess is um there'll there'll be some uh really splashy um news you know like some splashy um uh, raid or law enforcement activity related with the group that did this right unless this is like lockbit or no even lockbit is a ransomware as a service they might get it i i honestly think siege sec right here sieged said if i could is going to be in the news with like us law enforcement um, doing something to them. I'm just looking at um, Siege said threat actor profile. I'm kind of curious about them. Um, formerly known as Yuanon Wolf. Uh, oh, that actually that's uh, their leader. They are a hacktivist group. Again, this right here, Idaho National Labs attacking that doesn't seem like a hacktivist related type thing. Um, where are they out of? Are they out of Russia? Um, yeah, it looks like they're out of Russia. They target U.S. and Colombia, Mexico, India. Oh, they target Russia, China, Belgium. So I don't know. These guys are just kind of like mercenaries. 
it seems like. It says they're into hacktivism, but I'm telling you guys, this doesn't seem like, a, the Idaho National Labs doesn't seem like a hacktivism type thing. I didn't see anything, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't see anything in the news about them like hacking and then saying like, oh, like all your, um, you know, all the research you're doing is is killing the planet or climate change or, you know, whatever. Like the, I didn't see any of that. I just saw breach and then post. So you tell me. Although I should, I should be mindful about what I'm saying. I should probably approach today cautiously Mercy! as I came out the gate, trash, throwing shade at the Royals and, and got, um, I can't sit down. If it, if it, if it looks like I'm walking funny, it's because I mentioned the Royals and got, got, uh, got blown up here. The Idaho National Laboratory, a nuclear research lab, has allegedly been breached by Sieged Sec, which oh, claims what? to be in possession of PII belonging to users, employees, and citizens. Sorry. According to CyberScoop, quote, the scientists at Idaho National Laboratory work on some of the United States' most sensitive national security programs, including protecting critical infrastructure like the U.S. power grid from cyber and physical attacks. Personal data such as detailed employee and banking information would represent a treasure trove for foreign intelligence agencies looking to penetrate the lab, end quote. Me that is true. Uh, really quickly, Mono Julian with the super chat. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Mono Julian, we as Americans don't care about the Royals unless it's the Kansas City team or James Bond movie. Why did Carl click on the email link? He read the title about Royals and got the Royal ransomware. Oh! Thanks, Mono Julian, for the super chat, as always. <laughs> Um, also guys, um, I, again, the stories are kind of like stacked on top of each other today. So it's like digging through the kitchen junk drawer, looking for a paper clip. So I'm sorry that they're kind of, uh, getting, uh, messed up here a little bit. Uh, one thing that they did say, which is worth noting is that this information, while they did not get nuclear secrets, they did potentially get access to financial information of, uh, employees at the labs. So technically when you, um, when, when you, yeah, we did cover Idaho National Labs on Friday, but um, this is like a follow-up, I guess. Um, one thing that's worth noting, and this is a bit of a long play, but when you go and get a security clearance, at least in the United States, one of the things that they ask you about is your financial history. And it's because like, are you in bankruptcy? Are you addicted to gambling? Have you, um, do you have like massive debts, like credit card debts, student loan debts, home mortgage debts, right? Not to say that you can't have debt, but if you have debt or you're living paycheck to paycheck or um, you're trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents, right? Um, what's up, Tupac? Um, then you might be vulnerable to exploitation by a foreign uh, uh, intelligence agent to say, hey, like if you just, you don't have to tell us anything, just tell us what time the security guard goes for a walk at the lab. And in exchange, we'll make your debt go away. Or we'd love to give you $10,000 a month. Uh, and you don't have to do anything right now. But at some point, we might ask you to borrow your key card. Is that okay? Here's 10 grand. And oh my gosh, imagine that. Like now you can get your kids Christmas presents. Or oh, you're going to be the hero of your family. Or oh, you're going to get those. Um, you're going to be able to bet on the Super Bowl, right? Maybe they just go straight up for your gambling addiction. Whatever it is, there is a if then this, then that kind of play that could happen with this information. It's not just straight up social engineering and hacking into your bank account to take your money. Sometimes there's a longer play um, at play. Well, Canada's privacy commissioner is investigating a cyber attack that, quote, compromised data on current and former members of the country's armed forces and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, end quote. The breach involves two companies, Brookfield Global Relocation Services and Serva Canada LP, which both provide relocation services for Canadian federal personnel and are involved in around 20,000 moves each year. Given that this breach may have included relocations dating back to 1999, up to 480,000 people may have been affected. All right. I don't know. I can't comment on that. I'm really... I'm irritated by CISO series today. Like I get that they stacked all the stories for the few days, but like I'm, I'm all over the place with what stories to show you and what stories to talk about. We're halfway through the show. We're at the bottom of the hour. So I'm just going to go into the mid rolls, but, um, tough day, tough Monday guys. Jeez. 
And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud. For some people, ignorance is bliss, but that's not an option for those of us in cybersecurity. SpyCloud has a free tool that lets you check your company's darknet exposure, and you might find some things that are pretty alarming. Go to spycloud.com slash CISO to see your company's exposure from data breaches and even InfoStealer malware infections that can open the door to ransomware. SpyCloud's focus is helping businesses act on what criminals are using right now to target them, addressing stolen passwords, cookies, and even API keys automatically to stop criminals in their tracks. To learn more and get your darknet exposure report, go to spycloud.com slash CISO. That is S-P-Y-C-L-O-U-D dot com slash CISO. Oh, James McQuiggan with the office space reference. Looks like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. Let's let's do that. Uh, yeah, let's do this. This is how I am right now. Between the Royals, between all these stories, Mondays, am I right? All right, guys, let's do this. James McQuiggan with the Gifted Subs. Thanks so much, James. All right. Um, John Hobbs, a.k.a. Rotten Eggs, uh, please tag somebody to continue the tradition of the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Uh, Rotten Eggs, we're going to uh, keep an eye out for you on that. By the way, if this is your first episode, I forgot to say that earlier. If this is your first episode, thanks for the squad membership, uh, BSEC, as always. Thanks, Ben. If this is your first episode of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing Podcast, drop a hashtag first timer in chat. We have a sound effect and an emote for you. We love our first timers. Hashtag first timer in chat if today is your first episode. Every single day of the week has a special segment, and today is our newly Simply Cyber Community member segment, where I like to feature one member of the community. And Kimberly was last week. This week, I would love all of you to get to know Stefan Waldvogel. Uh, many of you know him. Stefan has been a Simply Cyber Community member since the inception. And the one thing, so Stefan, he has done so many wonderful things for the cybersecurity community. I met him because he was posting on LinkedIn valuable content, and I wanted to make a video about it. Our friendship blossomed from there. But one thing you may not know, and one reason I want to share him is because the I did not have a Simply Cyber Discord server for the longest time. I pushed back on it, and uh, Stefan Walvogel created a Discord server for his needs. And then when he didn't have those needs anymore, he brought me in. He he put training wheels on it, and I spun it. I, I took it and ran with it. And the reason there's a Simply Cyber Discord server is because of this man right here, Stefan Waldvogel. Thank you for all you do to the Simply Cyber community. You are a man among men, a giant. All right. And do me a favor. Go connect with him. He's, he's an awesome follow on LinkedIn. Always sharing valuable information. Follow him right there. Uh, and really quickly, I see that we've got some first timers in chat. First timers, Namita D. What's up, Namita? Welcome to the party, pal. What's up, Father of Legends? First time in chat. We'll take it. Welcome to the party, pal. And John Hobbs has tagged Keith Ferguson. Keith Ferguson with the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. So please, Keith, uh, go post your story and let's uh, let's get into that. Brandon W. loves the Simply Cyber Community and connected with almost 200 members in the last two days. Heck yeah. Let's keep going. In the legal sector, potentially hundreds of UK law firms are affected by CTS cyber attack. CTS is a managed service provider for law firms in the UK and is investigating a cyber incident that, according to industry news outlet Estate Agent Today, may be related to the Citrix bleed bug. The incident has disrupted the services of CTS, leaving, quote, hundreds of British law firms unable to access their case management systems, end quote. And now moving. All right. A couple things here. Um, I mean, so, dude, like the, the story. Here's the thing. It's like wild cards or variables. If you've ever done any software programming, there's variables and you can change the value of the variable. It's like a fundamental programming concept. Here's the deal. <laughs> this is another story where cloud service provider goes down and gets in, in, impacts downstream clients. UK law firms 
are using some outsourced solution, which is totally reasonable, to manage their case files. Very sensitive information. Chain of custody, right? All, all these, maybe not chain of custody, but all these sensitive things, right? Evidence, disclosure, strategy for the cases, whatever. And because of something that was not within the scope of the law firm, they are screwed. They are impacted. They are unable to access their case file. So if they're going into uh, court today or, or whatever, the, whatever the UK people do, somebody get the royals on the phone and let me know what, the, what the, they call it in UK. But if they go into whatever they call court, right? Law, uh, judicial proceedings, whatever. And they don't have their files. They're not equipped. It's like going to like it's like going to coach a football game and not having the play sheet, right? Not being able to call in the plays or understand what the research is on your opponent. This is a downstream impact. If I had to guess, um, I, I'm I'm assuming because it is so widespread, hundreds of British law firms unable to access their case files because it is so widespread. I could see maybe the UK government. Um, making some exceptions, postponing court cases until it gets sorted out. Um, I don't know how they're going to do it. Now, they said that it may be because of Citrix bleed. I've said this exhaustively in the last two weeks. If you are not um, well-versed in Citrix bleed, right? Hold on. Let's get a Citrix bleed. Citrix bleed logo. There we go. If you're not well versed in Citrix Bleed and you're trying to break into the industry, it would be hold on one second. There we go. It would be pretty useful, I would argue, to understand not a super deep dive, but understand a bit about what Citrix Bleed is and how it works. Um, because a lot of businesses use Citrix. It is very, it's so hot right now. Oh my God, let's use the emote. We got a brand new emote and Citrix Bleed, and I got a sounder. Citrix Bleed is so hot right now. Where's my... That Hansel's so hot right now. Yeah, Citrix Bleed is so hot right now. Hopefully you guys heard that sound effect. Um, that people who are hiring are going to know about it. And if you know about it, it's definitely going to be like, oh man, this guy or this lady are staying on top of what's going on. This is good. Um, again, these businesses that are getting hit by Citrix Bleed, I, I hate to say shame because I don't want to throw shade because every... Bit complicated businesses have complicated problems, but dude, Citrix Bleed's been out for a few weeks. You're a third party provider to a bunch of law firms and you, you can't get Citrix sorted out. I, it just seems, it just seems sussy, right? Sussy. All right, let's keep going. To the software sector, Atomic Steeler malware strikes Mac OS. Apple computers are being targeted through the ClearFake browser update scam, which originally started with Windows users in July. As of November 17th, this has spread to iOS through a fake Safari browser update page. Downloading from this page drops an information-stealing malware called Atomic, which, according to the researchers at Trellix and Cybul, quote, attempts to steal passwords, cookies, and credit cards stored in browsers, local files, and data from over 50 cryptocurrency extensions and keychain passwords, end quote. File sharing. All right, here we go. Get your Carl here. Carl! All right, guys. This is, I'm going to talk about the story at a high level and then tell you exactly what to do operationally. Okay. So if you think, or if you have anybody in your business, like executives, <clears throat> like you're a window shop, except the CEO, she uses wind, uh, an Apple computer because reasons. Malware exists for Apple computers. Okay. I feel like that myth has been busted and socially accepted. So it's like less prevalent. Dude, back in like the, mid 2000s you like apple couldn't have malware like there that was like a, a myth that was being like pushed around it can right and as more people adopt it it gets more focus from the threat actors um atomic stealer is a malware it steals um obviously it's called a stealer which is a type it steals it probably steals cookies tokens credentials passwords api keys if it finds it right all these things uh, but here's the TLDR for you. It initially infects the dropper is through this fake Safari landing page, 
um, where it's going to say you need to download this thing. You can see right here the download button. When you download it, you're downloading a dropper, which is an initial stage infection. The dropper, uh, well, I assume it's the dropper, not the stealer. Um, hold on. Uh, let me see if the word dropper's in here. No, it's not. Okay. Um, so sometimes it's a dropper. In this case, like you're literally just downloading malware. Like you're literally downloading malware straight up to your machine and installing it under your permissions. This Safari download, it should say Atomic Stealer Malware Download button, okay? So here's the, the reason that you gotta be mindful. Oh! Take this screenshot, right? If, if it were me, I would take this screenshot and use it in a uh, just-in-time um, information security awareness email and send it to people and say, hey, listen, this right here, this is what it looks like when threat actors are trying to get you to install malware. This is what it looks like, right? It doesn't look scary. It doesn't have hairy tentacles coming out of it. It doesn't have a hooded figure, right? Operating in the shadows. There's no flaming donkey here. I don't suggest you use that. That's an inside joke for the Simply Cyber community. But this looks like bubblegum apple fonts, bubblegum apple color scheme. And yes, like just, yes, update, update, update. So I, and I, I also, I would not tell them that this is like localized to Safari or localized to Apple. I would say, hey, listen, first of all, be on the lookout for this because this is a straight up attack. But in the bigger picture, this is how threat actors trick you into falling for uh, downloading malware. It looks legitimate. So don't be, don't, don't be, you know, I don't want to say don't be a fool, but don't let them win. Fight the good fight. And by the way, share this with your friend, family and loved ones. By the way, that's like a pro tip, guys. Like I, I always say this, but like, if you can kind of like make it, if you can make the information security awareness like this one, a little bit um, accessible and a little bit easy for Carl, right? Or Carl! for a non-infosec professional to turn around and share it with their family and loved ones, you're going to do two things. One, you're going to increase cyber risk reduction overall, which is great. Two, you're going to turn that person into like a security champion. Because if you just think about human psychology, they're going to turn around and have a piece of valuable information to share with the people that they respect and that they care about. So if they're turning around and saying that, they're going to be, feel good because they're doing a good thing for the people they care about. And the reason they're able to do that good thing is because you have equipped them with the tools and the knowledge to be able to do that, which means they're going to like you more. This is how you build political capital as well as drive cyber risk reduction. So take advantage of this. Do not in any way get wrapped around the axle on technical details, on how cool the vulnerability is, on leet speak, on zero days. Do, you got to use terminology that the individual receiving the message is going to understand and want to use themselves. Simple to the point and focus on the impact um, to them if, if they fall victim, right? It doesn't matter that this is a wicked cool atomic Stealer malware operating out of Eastern Europe. It's been seen, you know, it's got C2 infrastructure and a cool infographic. I'm telling you, just straight up, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Software owned cloud warns of critical vulnerabilities. According to the maintainers of the open source file sharing software, three vulnerabilities exist that could be, quote, exploited to disclose sensitive information and modify files, end quote. Own Cloud recommends that users delete a getphpinfo.php file and disable the PHP info function, as well as hardening measures to the validation code in the OAuth 2 app. The vulnerabilities are considered critical because they do not require any authentication. All right. So vulnerabilities that require no authentication are bad, real bad. Now, Jesus Christ. Oh, sorry, Kennedy. This is not good. Uh, so I, I didn't hear the whole story, but like um, CVSS score of 10, 10 is the highest. 10 is red hot. 10 is open sore. 10 is 
wound, like trauma, you know, like get this person in a, a med crash cart and get him to the ER stat. Okay. Web dev API 9.8, not good. Not good. And then 9.0. Normally a 9.0 would be bad, but like this guy right here, this guy's waiting in the uh the the OR, I mean the uh, ER waiting room while these two get sorted out. Holy crap. Uh what is the scope of this uh share okay, open source file sharing software called OwnCloud. All right, so OwnCloud I've never heard of. It's open source, so there are flaws. Um this one's not good. What I would say here is two things, or I would say three things, okay? Hold on. I mean, these vulnerabilities are massively problems. You can access anything, you can delete, you can modify, which means you could use it to host malware, compromise it. Not good, um, not good. So here's the thing, a couple, couple ideas. One, if you are using own cloud, right? One, you should absolutely uh, follow the directions in here to get rid of it. Two, I don't know from the story, I don't know from the story, but it would be beneficial to have some it, uh, ability to identify if you are running own cloud because, because people, here's the deal. Even though we have asset inventory and software asset inventory, it's the second control in CIS um, 18, and it's a it's a premier control in the NIST cybersecurity framework in the identify section. The reality is people will stand up their own solutions if they can, right? If you don't have permissions locked down in your environment and R&D people, somebody who got, you know, like has a degree in like pharmacology, but they dabble in IT, right? They're going to spin up stuff. And I'm not, I'm not saying pharmacology because of Brady McNulty. I just, because I worked in, um, I worked at an academic medical center and the pharmacology people, for some reason, were always the ones dabbling in the uh, tech space. Here's the deal. You may not know that you're running this own cloud thing. And I don't know what data is in this own cloud. It sounds like a localized file server type system. Okay. At the end of the day, that's what it is. So I would I would figure out how to scan to see if you're actually running this thing and then uh, connect with those people and tell them to get this sorted out and then tell them to stop standing up infrastructure that they shouldn't. Okay, there is a solution, at least as um, um, a stopgap to fix it. But these are three major issues, three major issues, okay? Um, now, the other thing I would say is, uh, two things. One, if you are into pen testing and um, offensive security, it may be not a bad idea to download this code. It is open source, so you can go get it anywhere. Install it in a lab and then try to do these exploits, right? They seem, I don't want to say trivial, but they seem somewhat easy, right? You can disclose sensitive creds and configures. Do it and see how it works. Like if you're looking to get a little bit more experience and understand how these things work, um, these are three, to me, it seems like lower hanging fruit from an offensive security practitioner perspective. So you could get those experiences. And then the final thing I'll say, and this is a huge one for resume stats. Um, and if if you um, want to... Um, Oh my God, what's his name? Joe Hell, the mayor over at TCM Academy. Let me see if I can find this. Let me see if I can do this in real time. Joe Hell, CVE, Sunday, mess around, cybersecurity, just a bunch of keywords. Uh, here we go. So I haven't found, I haven't read this article, but I attended Wild West Hackenfest. Um, let me see. I attended Wild West Hackenfest. Um, let me see if this is. Yep. So this is probably it. Okay. I attended Wild West Hacking Fest last year. Obviously, I'm wearing the shirt, but I attended it in 2022 also. And Joe Hell gave a talk that I attended, and he talked about finding CVEs. And and I recommend that you watch this video. But the crux of the matter is that you can find CVEs. You don't have to find CVEs in Microsoft Office or you know Apple. 
uh, operating system. You can find them in open source software and they're just as valuable. And he shows you his working methodology on how he found these. Now, why, why am I telling you this? Are you like, oh my God, Jerry, like who cares? Like, ooh, CVEs, they're fun. Here's the deal. If you have CVEs on your resume that you discovered and are attributed to you, that is a massive cut the line kind of move on your resume. I'll repeat that. If you have CVEs that you discovered and are attributed to you, that is a massive cut the line for job interviews and resumes. It's 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 arguably in chat I would love I would love for you to comment on this. If you have it on your resume, I would almost put it the first like your name and then right there under summary. Like it should be like one of the first things. It is such an eye catching highly desirable, very interesting fact about you if you have a CVE attributed to you. And they again, no one says, well, what kind of software was it? People just say, holy, sh you have a CVE? Let's talk, okay? It's a massive cut the line for getting a job, okay? Finally, in the software sector, the Mirai botnet reemerges, exploiting a zero day. Researchers at Akamai have discovered a new Mirai-based DDoS botnet which exploits two zero-day vulnerabilities to infect routers and video recorder devices. According to Security Affairs, the Akamai researchers discovered the botnet named Infected Slurs in October 2023, and fixes are expected in December. Quote, the bot also targets wireless LAN routers built for hotels and residential applications. End quote. Remember, we'll all right. So this story, again, we covered this story the other day. I'll just briefly um, cover this really quickly, okay? Um, by the way, can we just really quickly, hold on. RC flaws, compromised routers. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Again, I really shouldn't care. I shouldn't care, but like I'm, I'm, I'm investigating... Like this right here, this screenshot, I don't know if this screenshot um, has anything to do with the story. And it, it, it annoys me when they do that. It annoys me when they do that. Uh, yeah. So this, it says October, 2023, and this says April, 2023. And if I'm not mistaken, the left side and the right side are identical. So I don't know what, what you're getting. Plus, it says um, two zero-day RCEs are being exploited, but I don't, these don't look like that. Like it just it's annoying to me. You know why it's annoying to me? Because people who are not people who are new to the industry, right? Like Chris Young, like just to, to name one, right? Chris is transitioning out of the Marines and getting spun up and everything. And then you see this story, and then you see this screenshot and you're like oh oh let me let me look at this screenshot let me understand what's going on it looks like a bunch of gobbledygook oh i'm overwhelmed oh i don't understand oh this industry is too hard and in reality this screenshot as far as i can tell doesn't have anything to do with the freaking mirai botnet or these two rce flaws that are being compromised i hate when they do that that i'm, I'm sorry that i'm full of vitriol today throwing shade at the royals and throwing shade at in, at, at screenshots and stuff but it's just annoying because to me, this is intentionally confusing to people who aren't in the know. It looks cool. Ooh. Oh, I see memory addresses. Wow. Wow. All right. So we covered this story on Friday. We're at time anyways. Here's the deal. Mirai Botnet's been around since 2015. Three Rutgers kids dropped it on GitHub thinking that they would hide in the noise. And instead, the FBI already knew who they were, arrested them. And the rest of the world's threat actors scooped up Mirai and use it to spread. It has a great spreading mechanism. If you're running Telnet port 23 in your environment, which unbelievably still happens in 2023, coincidence on the 23, um, then um, like shut it down or figure out why the hell... Sorry, Kennedy. Figure out why you're running Telnet, okay? Secondly, and to, um, to uh, B-Sec's point, uh, Mia, I'll explain CVEs in one second. Uh, secondly, to B-Sec's point, 
Why are you running a video recorder on facing the internet? This is a technology that does not need to be internet facing. That's a poor engineering design or architecture design. It is a poor, um, uh, misconfigured system. And unfortunately, it could have just been, um, you know, not an engineer. It could have just been Carl. Could have been a small business owner, whatever it is. Don't have tech that doesn't need to be internet facing, facing the internet. That is step one. Also, since I'm a little bit hot under the collar right now, go to Shodan.io, Shodan.io. You can use monitor. Hopefully I'm not logged in and you see my IP range, but um, okay. go to monitor.shodan.io. They actually, if I'm not mistaken, they do sometimes do Black Friday pricing. Um, and you can actually have Shodan regularly scan your external facing IP range to tell you what's there uh, proactively. I love it. I love it. I love it. Let's go. All right, really quickly, Mia W, I'm going to answer your question uh, in a hot second. Um, listen, if you were here just for the news, I thank you very much. It is nine o'clock. Wish you all the best. Again, apology to the Royals. I have my own opinions and thoughts. I just don't get it. Uh, but if you're a Royals fan, the UK, not the Kansas City baseball team, um, you are, you know, you're more than welcome here. You're welcome to your opinion. I hope I'm a huge advocate of healthy, open discourse. So um, let's do that now, really quickly. Uh, let's pivot over to jaw. Jack well, hold on, Mia. I'm going to answer your question during jaw jacking. Okay. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I got to share with you guys. Um, I kind of came out the gate hot today. Um, this Thursday, really quickly, this Thursday, just so you guys know, we're going to be um, welcoming. Where is it? We're going to be welcome Gary Binder. Do you guys remember Gary? I don't know if you remember him, but Gary came on. He was from Intel, but. This is not an Intel. Um, this is not an Intel related uh, talk. This is just Gary coming to talk about quantum computing. Okay, this is not an Intel sponsored talk. This is Gary, quantum computing crypto guy. And by by the way, guys, like I was like, oh Gary, I know about crypto. I mean, not cryptography. I know about quantum and uh, encryption. And he's like, oh. And then he started talking, and he went like four hundred levels deep. And I'm like. Oh, like, you know, the scene from uh, mods, can I get this? You know, the scene where um, Indiana Jones in the last crusade, when the guy drinks from the wrong cup, that was my face. When Gary started talking about encryption, I was like, holy crap, dude, the simply cyber community could definitely benefit from you. So he's coming on as a friend and as a member of the simply cyber community. I hope you guys can come over on um, Thursday and check it out. Now, we're going to get into jaw jacking if you want to holler. Uh, and we're going to start with Mia's question. So let's do that right now. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Jaw Jacking. I am your host, Jerry Guy, coming hot off the heels of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing podcast. And we're going to start right with a question here that uh, Mia W asked. What are CVEs? Okay, guys. So CVEs are a uh, common vulnerability enumeration. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, CVE common. Yeah. Uh, common vulnerability, maybe not enumeration. Yeah, it is. It is common vulnerability enumeration. Okay. So it's not going to make a lot of sense, Mia, but stay with me. Okay. Let me, let me get this sh shared screen up here. Okay. So check this out. Um, let me get rid of this. Let me move this over. Let me move. Oh my God, brah. Okay. So, oh my God, let me, let me share this. Okay. So here's the deal. CVEs are basically maintained by NIST, right? And a CVE is a vulnerability that has been disclosed by somebody, security researcher, threat actor, whatever, 
and has been accepted by the vendor as a known vulnerability and it's being tracked. So think of CVEs as a list of vulnerabilities, okay? Now, when we say CVE, they all have a unique identifier. And just, this is uh, CISA, really quickly, Jen Easterly, what's up? What's up, Jen? All right, so Mia, this is a list of, you know, actively exploited CVEs. Now, right here, you can see CVEs always have this designation, CVE dash year it was discovered, and then a unique identifier name. Now, one thing that people may not know is that the larger organizations like Microsoft and Apple and Citrix and Zixel and all these, they get they get allocated like a bundle of numbers, right? So like just to be simple, let's say that Microsoft has CVE 00001 to CVE 49. 999, right? So zero to 49,999, right? So they have 50,000 possible CVEs. So when it's 2024, right? In a couple weeks, 2024 and the first vulnerability drops for Microsoft operating system, right? Microsoft can say, hey, CVE 2024-0001 is this. Now, let's say Apple gets CVE uh, bundle 50,000 to 55,000. So on January 1st, an Apple uh, vulnerability drops, that CVE will be CVE 2024-50,000. So I, I just want to point out, because this confused me for a while, this number right here does not indicate that this was the 40,539 vulnerability disclosed in 2021. It's just the numbering convention. And then there's some upper limit where at some point, um, anyone like open source software, these type of things will get uh, that number and NIST will allocate that number. Now, a CVE, why is it so important? I and mean, why do I say that it's a game changer, Mia? CVEs basically mean that you discovered a zero day flaw in a piece of software and then you either exploited it in your criminal or you did responsible disclosure to the vendor, either through a bug bounty platform or directly through the vendor's responsible disclosure uh, program, they have agreed that it is a real vulnerability and they have requested and allocated a CVE um, identifier for it, in which point the vendor is going to take over, the vendor is going to fix a patch, the vendor is going to communicate it out. So for example, Citrix bleed, right? Citrix bleed is a major vulnerability that's being actively exploited. The move it uh, from progress software vulnerability that was compromised by Clop ransomware to great, great uh, damage that was a CVE, right? So because the CVE is uniquely identifiable and can be independently validated, if you, Mia, discover a vulnerability and disclose it through a... Uh, a program and you get a CVE, then CVE 2024 50,001 is Mia's CVE. Nobody ever can ever have that CVE um, uh, attributed to them, right? Because it's 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 been allocated, it's been spent, right? But to have a CVE means that you have effectively done software research, security research, you've done vulnerability disclosure. See, you cannot buy a CVE. You cannot work for a company and get a CVE, or you're not supposed to, right? So to do it is an indication of your initiative, your proactivity, your skill, your capability, and everybody knows what a CVE is in the industry, including you now, right? So it is very desirable. It is, it is so hot. That Hansel's so hot right now. And it, and it doesn't, it does not expire. It doesn't, it doesn't, age out. Okay. If you have a CVE from 2015, you still have a CVE. And that talk from Joe hell shows you how he found it, um, on a Sunday night screwing around and his methodology is sound. I myself personally actually have it on my 2024, um, uh, goals list as a stretch goal to get a CVE speaking at black hat is a, is a goal. And getting a CVE is a goal. Neither of those things you should be able to buy. I know you can buy a Black Hat spot speaking gig, but to me, that wouldn't count as um, winning. Okay. Hopefully that was good. Let's keep talking. I definitely have a pot of coffee. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, here is me. I, I, I forget why I asked for this. Mods, thank you. I forget why I asked for this uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, but this is me. This is me doing whatever it is that I said I was doing uh, with my face melting. I forget why I even asked for it, honestly. Um, all right. All right, so I'm just getting this now. Uh, CVEs are not maintained by NIST. CVEs are common vulnerabilities and exposures. Josh Mason is fact checking me. I appreciate that. I will say that everything I just said is accurate though about the CVEs. Here, we'll drop a link in here, cve.org. Did NIST used to manage it? Am I wrong? All right, well, how CVE, CISA and NIST, I wanna give myself partial credit here, manage vulnerabilities. I'd like to give myself partial credit, judges. All right. Since I'm in control of the judges, I'm going to take credit for it. Thanks, uh, Josh Mason, for fact checking that. Uh, Mia, here's all these links are very good. So go check those out. All right. Let's keep going here, guys. Tough day. I feel like my cadence is off today. I'm not, I'm not feeling good here. All right. Later, BSEC. Are there any haiku lives today? Also, I, no, I'm not doing haiku uh, live stream today. It's every other Monday. I only have two live streams left um, in the year. And December 4th is the next one. Carrie also says, is Hack in the Box and Haiku? I'm going to get into th these in KevTech. What else can I do since I didn't have the answers when asked about experience? Those are both great options, uh, Carrie. Definitely practical hands-on experience is where it's at. KevTech does great work with like AD and standing up AD. Um, TCM Academy's practical ethical hacking course has you stand up Active Directory. So that would be good too. Uh, Zatalpa, what's up, Zatalpa? Says, uh, I stumbled across this channel randomly, but the show was top of the recommended list of useful content for the LSU Cyber Boot Camp. Yes, Zatalpa. Um, thank you. And uh, shout out to LSU. Thank you very much. I'm glad that we made, we made the list and uh, glad that you ra randomly stumbled in here. I see that you're a squad member, so hopefully you stick around. It's great to have you here. Welcome to the party, pal. Joel Belton, be well, man. Good to see you. Jamie Fleck. Jamie Fleck, who, uh, for those who don't know, Jamie and I went to high school together. What's up, Jamie? Good to see you. Go Trojans. Can you recommend any books that describe malware? you did earlier today. All right, Jamie, are you saying any books that describe malware that we covered in the news briefing, like Atomic Stealer and stuff like that? Because that I can't. Um, a couple things. So Jamie is asking about malware books. What I would say is, Jamie, if you're looking for like textbooks that teach you about malware and practical hands-on labs of malware, then... Um, Really, this book is a little dated, but um, this book is dated, but it's still considered the seminal work in our industry. Come on, man. Oh, my God. This is considered the seminal book in our industry. Practical malware analysis. Um. It, again, it's from like 2012, so it's it's 11 years old. It's a little old, but workflows methodology. If you want to get into malware, this is a great option. Um, if you want to be taught malware, um, let me show you this one. Um, Doctor Josh Strohshine, who who I love, I love this guy. And that's not hyperbolic. Josh and I graduated DSU PhD together. Um, he's an amazing individual. He's a very thoughtful, caring person, and he's incredibly freaking smart. And he's got a ton of content on the channel on um, doing malware analysis, and he walks you through it. And then finally, finally, if you're looking for a book, Jamie... Um, this is a recommendation from Jenny Housley, our very own safety girl. And I'm like partly through it. 
don't ignore the fact that I'm using the book cover as a bookmark. I know people hate that, but I do. This one goes into five different stories of five different seminal pieces of malware, starting with the Morris worm. I'm in chapter two, which is talking about Vienna, um, which was a uh, com dot com file malware. But this is a good book. Easy, not easy read, but it's a it's a it's a beach read about malware. I would get into that. Okay, here we go. Elite Gunslinger, have you used the FAIR risk model? What's your opinion if you have? Okay, so I've studied FAIR. By the way, really quickly, uh, for those who don't know, FAIR is a acronym. It stands for, give me a second. It stands for... What does it stand for? Hold on. I, I do I do like it. That's why I'm I'm I want to. Hmm. Oh, here it is. Um. All right, I forget what it stands for. It's an acronym, though. But um, fair is a um risk assessment methodology that uses quantification as best it can to give ranges of probability of events happening and ranges of financial impacts of thing happening. I will tell you this elite gunslinger fair methodology. I've never used it in a, um, engagement. I have studied it. I have taken, uh, seminars from fair Institute and I have a very good friend, Steve Cardinal, who has used the fair methodology and speaks highly of it. I think fair is phenomenal. The, the, the problem is, okay, so FAIR is great. I would definitely recommend FAIR for a risk assessment methodology. The challenge you're going to run into is if you've taken my GRC course, which by the way is 30% off until Friday with code SimplyCyber30 if you're interested in that. There, I'll drop a link in the... Um... There you go. If you There's the GRC class and then a 30% off um, coupon code. So here's the deal. Fair methodology is quantified. Traditional uh, methodologies like the one I teach in that GRC class right there is a qualitative methodology. Qualitative means like traffic light, like red, yellow, green. It's kind of bad, low likelihood, uh, medium likelihood, high likelihood, right? Very squishy. Quantified is numbers. You have a 42 to 68 percent chance of suffering a three million to four million dollar um, cyber incident in 2024. Quantified risk assessment is much more actionable. Executives, business, they like data points. They like information. Okay, so why would you use the subjective or the qualitative one ever if the quantitative one is better and well more well received from the business? The reason is the quantified one takes longer. Also, the quantified one requires inputs from the business on um, the, the value of things, workflows, financials. Like there's a lot more of, um, there's a lot more data inputs that need to go in to inform the FAIR methodology than the qualitative methodology. So it takes more engagement from the business, which you may not get. It requires more accurate information, which you might not have. And it requires more time to execute, which you may not also have. So then you're you're presented with, I can give you a better methodology for $100,000 in three months of time, or I can give you a pretty good one for $40,000 in one month of time. Now you're getting into, it's, it's less about the impact and value. And now you're talking about, do you want a... Chevy Cobalt, or do you want a Chevy or a, a Cadillac, right? They're both going to drive you to where you're going. One of them is going to be way nicer and be, you know, much more bells and whistles and you could do more with it. But do you want to spend the extra $60,000 right now? Do you want to take the extra three months? Are you trying to just, you know, do the minimum? Are you just trying to like, you know, shoestring budget this thing? Or are you trying to mature to an optimized security program, Right. It gets into business decisions. That That's what's up with that. Okay. So yes, fair. Let's go. Vishnu Minon, squad member, wow. says, how do you tackle... And by the way, I'm going to leave in three minutes. Okay. I've got uh, a 9.30 meeting and I have to... Uh, I have to... I have to 
how to take a bio break. All right. How do you tackle information overload as a beginner breaking into cyber? I feel there's so much I don't know. Well, Vishnu, there is a lot. Okay. So I'll tell you that with information overload, first of all, um, you might want to write this down and stick it on a sticky note against the wall. Um, so, holy, re really quickly, Knox Lumens. No, the one on TCM Academy and the one on my school are identical. Um, I, I manage them both. Basically, the the um, the the one in my school, I get all the revenue from, and the one in TCM Academy, I get a portion of it. Th those are the two differences. Uh, but the actual content, the student experience, is all the same. Later, Josh Mason. All right, let me just uh, rapid fire these last couple questions because I have to leave in two minutes. Vishnu, you're absolutely going to get overloaded. What I would recommend is know this. I've been in the industry 20 years. Josh Mason's been in a while. Um, so many people in here have been in a long time, right? I I still don't know it all, right? Like I, I, I'm, I couldn't tell you much about Android malware, right? I can't do deep analysis on you know certain things. So I still have a ton to learn and I've been in it for 20 years. So, so know that you will never learn it all. You will always have information overload. So just accept that as a reality and then you can you know, accept it and move on. Second thing, you should have a plan. Make sure that you have a plan on where you're going and what you're doing and not just kind of like, woo, woo, woo. Stop chasing shiny, shiny objects. Have a plan, stick to it. Have a plan for Q1 2024. What do you want to learn? Where do you want to go? Do you want to have a job? By June of 2024, well then make a roadmap of what's that job, what skills do you need, what what networks do you have to plug into, and then execute on that. Don't get overwhelmed. It's so easy to chase shiny objects in cybersecurity. All right. Um, final question from Nerman uh, with the super chat, by the way. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you, Nerman. Uh, hello, Dr. Osher. What's your opinion about dit? Bit Defender Total Security. Would you recommend it? I do not use Bit Defender. I'm I'm googling it right now. Let me look really quickly. I mean, I've heard of Bit Defender. Let's take a look. I, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other, Nerman. It's better than nothing, right? I would definitely say that. It's better than nothing. Um, you can protect all your devices. Okay. It really gets into a question of how is it perform? Obviously, their website's going to have all the great stuff. Um, they offer a VPN. Okay. I don't know. I mean, it looks okay. It depends where you're going to use it. Are you going to use it on Windows machine, iOS? I mean, I, I guess what I would say, um, Nerman, since I don't have experience with this particular product, I would start doing um, a Bitdefender comparison. I would do Bitdefender comparison. I would not go to the Bitdefender's website for the comparison because obviously they're going to have bias. Um, here we go. Cyber news. Again, here's the deal with this, right? Like this is probably good information, but you have to be mindful um, that th this has affiliate links in it. So they are motivated to want to uh, share something. Forbes has done a bit defender versus Norton. Norton and uh, Semantic have, have left the horrible taste in my mouth from the way they used to put bloatware in back in the day. Um, Forbes advisor actually has this as a five star, which is pretty cool. Norton, three and a half. I don't know. It looks pretty good, frankly. I don't know if other people in chat, but for me, really quickly, Norman, if I'm going to go with a solution, I would basically do comparisons from independent parties and see what's up. All right. All right, guys. I have to run. I want to say thank you, all of you. Hopefully, you guys had a good a good stream. I know we got off to a rough start with the Royals, but you know what? I got to stick to my guns. You know, I know we're not all going to agree on every. Here's the best part. We're not all going to agree on everything all the time, but if we can have a respectful discourse and share thoughts and ideas, then rock on.
All right, Rex Cognito spending super chat dollars to let you know, Nerman. Hashtag better than Norton. Hashtag better than McAfee. We just become best friends. Yep. All right. Hey, Chris Young, my 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 friend. I'm totally happy. Matt McDaniel, be good. Hemoglobin, be good. Kerry, be good. Alpha Sierra, have a good day. Nathan Boland, be well. Guys, thank you all so very much uh, for the stream. Thanks for being here. Let's go out and crush it. Happy holidays to everybody. Get your Cyber Monday on. Be well. And until next time, y'all, stay secure. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content, and we'll see you in the next one. Yeah! <laughs>